All right, we'll call Senate Finance back to order. Everyone has to behave. Big children, little children, moms, dads, presenters, let's go. All right, um, we are going to hear Senate Bill 162 first, and our own Senator Scheibel will be presenting. So please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you so much, Chair Don Darrow-Loop. For the record, my name is Melanie Scheibel. I'm the state senator from District 9. Happy to be in front of you presenting SB 162 today. I will keep it very short um, because it's a pretty simple bill. Uh, SB 162 requires every county in the state or every law enforcement agency that operates a jail or detention center to submit an annual plan to the, or to submit an annual plan to the Secretary of State explaining how they're going to allow eligible voters within that detention center to cast their ballots in any upcoming elections or special elections. Um, the fiscal notes are removed by the amendment that was made in the policy committee, which was the uh, Senate Committee on Legislative Operations and Elections. And um, I have also proposed one additional amendment, which I hope you all have. Okay. Um, it adds a section to the bill regarding the electronic voting system, uh, better known as EASE, and uh, that was at the request of the Secretary of State, and I'm happy to accept that amendment. It is permissive as opposed to um, requiring the jails or detention centers to do anything. It just allows them to utilize the EASE system if that is the method that any particular uh, sheriff, county, or, or detention center feels is most appropriate or most useful for their facility. Um, I have worked with the Nevada Association of Counties, uh, a couple of different county managers as well as their elections officials who have all confirmed that they are happy, well, that they are able to comply with this. Um, some of them are even happy to do it uh, because most of them are in fact um, facilitating voting in jails already. Um, and I can say that um, every county was concerned that if there was a person in one of in their custody who was not able to vote, that that should not be the case, and they wanted to remedy that. So um, I think this is a pretty measured approach just to ensure that every county gives it a little bit of thought and keeps that plan updated with the Secretary of State. Um, and the financial impacts would be minimal. That's it. Thank you, Senator. So when you say minimal, can you give me a roundabout on the fiscal? I can. Um, all of the entities that I talked to said that this would have no meaningful fiscal impact, not enough to put a fiscal note on the bill. They would remove the fiscal notes that were created by the first uh, version of the bill, and with the reprint, the, the cost would be, you know, a couple hours of somebody's time to put into writing the plan that they utilize and to email that over to the Secretary of State, which could easily be absorbed in somebody's existing uh, position. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Any and, and I think uh, oh, go ahead, Mr. Please. Chiara from the Secretary of State has. Oh, please. Go ahead, up. please. Thank you very much, Senator Scheibel. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Gabriel DeCara from the uh, Chief Deputy Secretary of State. And so EASE is a system that is already in place um, and in use for our um, uh, service members uh, overseas and, and domestically, as well as uh, as of the last legislative session, individuals with disabilities can, can use EASE as per Nevada statute. Every county in the state is already set up to accept votes via EASE. Um, it is a secure uh, transmission system. You can conduct voting on EASE with a simple laptop. There's a, a direct secure link um, between uh, that that laptop and the, and the county um, it is incredibly secure and and it, it is it, it carries no additional fiscal impact um, as, as long as the jail or detention facility has a laptop um, uh, there, there's no need for additional equipment or verification and the counties are already set up to accept it so that is why the fiscal note would be minimal thank you senator thank you very much all right questions uh, senator Gansert um, thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm looking at uh, number seven of the amendment. It talks about a county or city jail shall not prohibit, restrict, or monitor the use of the system of approved electronic transmission established to uh, to NRS dot dot dot. So so it should not prohibit or restrict, but the monitor the use. And so you have to monitor the system itself. But monitor the use means like watch someone vote, or can you d define that a little bit better? Um. Thank you, Senator Severs Ganser, Madam Chair, through you to the Senator. Uh, uh, Gabriel DeCare, for the record. Um, <laughs> yes, so m my understanding is that systems, uh, a system could be set up so that that 
the the ease website uh, nvees.gov uh, nv.gov would be the only website that uh, that laptop could could visit so the it would be secure entirely there's nothing else that the um, the individual could could access via that laptop and so it would just be yes they would be allowed to um, uh, enter their information vote as appropriate submit their ballot uh, w without being monitored that's my understanding okay thank you additional questions Senator Gokachan Thank you, Madam Chair. And then, but it would be up to the jail or the county clerk to determine whether they wanted to use your new each system or, or if they want to just issue paper ballots. Melanie Scheibel, for the record, that's correct. They would be allowed to use the Ease system. I think in some of um, our rural jurisdictions, they have so few people in custody at a given time that they can use a simple mail ballot or an absentee ballot, and they'd be able to continue doing that as well if that's their preference. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Additional questions or comments from the committee? All right. Thank you very much, Senator Scheibel, and thank you for being here this evening. All right. We will go to those in support of Senate Bill 162. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Anna Magnus, and I'm the Executive Director of Battleborn Progress. Uh, we are here in full support of SB 162. We are very excited about this bill. Um, we followed it through the Policy Committee. We've been working with Senator Scheibel from the beginning on this bill, and we think this is a great use of uh, money from the state to ensure that everyone in our community who is eligible to vote can. So we hope you will pass this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? here in Carson City. Las Vegas seeing none. BPS, is there anyone on the phone lines? The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you very much. Anyone in opposition of this Senate Bill 162? Anybody in Las Vegas? Anybody on the phone lines? BPS when you're ready. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you very much. And we will go to neutral here in Carson City in Las Vegas. On the phone lines, BPS when you're ready. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you very much. With that, closing comment, Senator Scheibel. All right. Um, we'll see if we can maybe add this to the work session in a little bit. All righty. With that, uh, we will close the hearing on Senate Bill 162, and we will open the hearing on Senate Bill 308. Senator Flores, welcome to Senate Finance. Good evening, Madam Chair, esteemed colleagues. I am Senator Edgar Flores, proudly representing Senate District 2, and I am here to present Senate Bill 308. By way of context and story, um, I'd like to just briefly explain how this bill came about. During the interim, we had an opportunity to sit in front of hundreds of teachers, uh, courtesy of the good work of CCA and ensuring that we had a very lengthy conversation uh, while speaking to these hundreds of teachers, we had an opportunity to meet J-1 teachers. J-1 teachers primarily come from the Philippines, and they come here on a three-year visa with the possibility of extending it uh, two additional years. But it often has to go through a waiver process. So the average lifespan of a J-1 teacher is three years. And they were talking to me about some of the challenges that they faced, namely two. Number one, how expensive it is for them to be a teacher here in the state of Nevada through the J-1 program. And second, um, how they were not uh, eligible for some certain benefits. With the amendment uh, during the policy committee, we got rid of the fiscal note. However, I know that there are still some concerns. And so I again amended the bill. And that is the version that I am going off of. If you are looking at Senate Bill 308, um, specifically, uh, I ask for you to direct your attention to on um, page 2, lines 31 through 34. 
and page 3, lines 1 through 13, which discussed uh, PERS vesting at three years. And the intention behind that was that I wanted to ensure that these teachers qualified uh, for PERS. But after conversations with uh, a lot of the stakeholders, we decided to remove that language and instead direct our attention to the second issue that I previously alluded to, which is the fact that some teachers are paying $5,000 to make and participate in this, in this program, J1 program, in our schools. And some are paying $15,000, $17,000. It didn't make sense to us, and in working with all the different teachers and in getting a lot of feedback, and I am very appreciative of our teachers providing that feedback, um, we've, we created our own model and realized that there's no reason why they can't do it for 5,000. So that's where the focus of this bill is at now, capping and ensuring that we are not charging our, our teachers who are coming here while we as a state are desperately demanding for them to come here. Remember, it's us who need them, and I feel that we were taking advantage of them through some of these programs, and it wasn't intentional, and I'm not, I'm not putting the blame on the school district. I'm really focusing on the third-party companies that we were utilizing to bring these teachers in. And so the focus now is on helping teachers who are presently helping us. And by the way, uh, just for, for those of you who may be curious, um, in Clark County School District, uh, it was estimated about 375 teachers are here in J1s, and almost every single one of them work with our most vulnerable uh, populations, uh, students with IEPs, special needs, et cetera. That's where the, these teachers are focusing and working with directly. And so I think it's incredibly important that we protect them. And with that, Madam Chair, any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Titus. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So with this amendment, and I certainly uh, um, appreciate taking out the PERS component. We thought that was going to be incredibly expensive. But looking at what is left then at Section 1.6 and the, and the number one. And so uh, these folks that help these teachers come to the United States, it's a service that they do, and they're paid to do that. What's the average cost of that? I mean, I'm just wondering if you're going to lose this the person that is that segue to bring these teachers here if you cap them at charging five thousand per teacher thank you for that question senator titus senator edgar flores for the record uh, that's how we landed at the five thousand we we've, we've heard of instances where it was cheaper and we've heard instances where it was much more expensive um but my position and we're going to continue this conversation as the bill continues to move to to ensure that the companies that are doing it for less than, for 5,000 or less, that they could, if the other companies, the ones that charge 15,000, if they said, we're, we're not gonna do it then, because we wanna charge 15,000, that's what we set the standard at, that the companies that charge 5,000 or less can say, we'll pick up that extra amount of teachers, we could easily bring them in. I just think that they, and this is not just an issue in the state of Nevada, by the way, there's a lot of lawsuits happening uh, nationwide around this conversation, because we really are exploiting uh, uh, these particular teachers. And a lot, of, oftentimes, it's just because they don't know. If, if you're sitting somewhere and, so, and a recruiter comes by, a third party says, I can get you a job in the U.S., you'll hear a bunch of different stories. Uh, at times that they don't tell them that it's just for three years. Um, they won't tell them all the cost up front. Um, they'll tell you stories about it's 5000 now, and there's going to be an additional 5000 and then they hit them with an additional bill afterwards. So I just think the way... And, and I am not suggesting that all these companies are doing that, by the way. But I think the way some of our teachers have been lured and recruited um, has been slightly disingenuous. And I think it was our responsibility, not the J-1 teachers, but us as a community, us as Nevada, to say, well, wait a minute. We desperately need you. We have a teacher shortage. Who's, who's making sure that we're not exploiting you? And I think with this bill, even with removing the other uh, language regarding the PERS, I still think that we're doing a great service to those teachers. Um, we're also having outside conversations of this room, particularly um, with trying to get uh, some, uh, maybe a proclamation or other information moving around, because we can also help them through the application process, but we don't have to do that through legislation. I think we can do that differently, but I think, so we do have m multiple moving parts in helping them, but that's the, that's the ultimate uh, focus and, and, and purpose of this bill. If we have companies that can do it for 5K or less, we cap it at that. We may modify this language a little bit slightly again uh, uh, once we move it to the assembly side to where there could be maybe a 3% growth with that, 
whatever the, the, the market dictates so that we allow for that over the years. But ultimately, that's, that's the focus and that's why we're here. Follow up, Madam Chair? Yes. To be clear then, um, so this is capping what the school will reimburse that teacher or that agency to bring that person here. Nothing stops the individual from paying an agency if they are a little bit more complicated or they charge a little bit more because it's extended and they have to do more work and somebody your the agency says yeah i can do this for five thousand say whoa you know that we can't do it for that an individual could hire somebody else to do this right this is just about the school reimbursement for the process thank you for that question senator titus senator edgar flores for the record correct well, and, and if i could just frame it a little bit differently but the answer is yes we, we want to ensure that the schools or the district is contracting with a third party that is capping it at that. But if an individual teacher, and by the way, J1s are utilized in other industries. We're just focusing on, on edu uh, educators. Um, but if they wanted to go through a different avenue and find somebody and pay the 10K or 15K, because for whatever reason, that's necessary, that's fine. But we are asking the, the schools specifically through this bill that they don't uh, contract out to anybody that's charging more than that. Additional questions? I have one. Um, can you, have you talked with PERS about this? Are they aware that you are dropping that piece to this bill? Yes, Madam Chair. I, I notified them. And Senator Edgar Flores, for the, for the record, uh, I had notified them. They saw this on the agenda. Um, and they originally had told me again that the fiscal note had been dropped. But now, obviously, very clearly with this language being removed, they understand that they're in no way implicated anymore. So this is just um, simply a bill to allow some standardization, if you will, of how much someone can charge to bring a J-1 teacher to the United States. That's correct. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Edgar Flores, for the record. And, and I don't want to pretend that Nevada is leading this conversation. Um, there's been a lot of very uh, horrific stories across the country on how we have been charging and an excessive amount to our teachers to where the, the money they're making, they're just reimbursing to some law firm. And we wanted to make sure that we uh, helped address that issue. I will say that Nevada wasn't as horrible as other states. Um, but unfortunately, we still have those horror stories where somebody's talking about how I paid 3000 and then they said they paid fifteen or 16000 How many other states actually do this? Do you know uh, off the top? Th thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Edgar Flores, for the record, I don't know off the top, but my understanding after doing some research and our legal help with that, um, most states have some type of J-1 program. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Gokachia. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, to the Senator, I, I guess I'm still kind of concerned how this is going to work. I realize the school district's capped, but we also know you and I have worked in this at different levels, but, uh, uh, you know, there's nothing in this that will stop, you know, that contractor, that person in between from saying, well, okay, we can get five back from the school, but you're still going to owe me five when, you get, when I get you the job. Thank you for that question, Senator Gorkachia. Senator Edgar Flores, for the record, I, I agree with you that that could be a potential harm to some of our teachers and they, that they continue to be taken advantage of. But my position is if we have a standard across the state, every single J-1 teacher will know that and that the community will kind of embrace it and, and, and really reinforce it and empower themselves. Because you're right, there's not going to be anybody next to that person, that third party who's luring them to the U.S. and promising them everything is going to be magical in the U.S. and you're going to love coming here. Um, I, I agree with you 100%. I think if we create this as a state, Hopefully that will create the educational campaign, informational campaign that will create those safeguards for our teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Any additional questions from anyone? All right. Thank you. All right. With that, we'll go to those in support of Senate Bill 308. Thank you. Good evening, Chair, members of the Senate Finance Committee. My name is Daniel Stewart, and I'm here on behalf of the Clark County Education so Association. I want to thank the sponsor. This is a critical piece of legislation. He, he read you some of the, the numbers. Uh, nearly 400 teachers in Clark County uh, are under this program, and they are in our hardest f to fill positions. Um, you've heard quite a bit this session about our teacher vacancy crisis. 
this is a key component to that. Um, I, d I do also want to mention the, the districts will always play a key component in this. So even if there's, because they have to be involved in the sponsorship um, uh, in this as far as providing the jobs. And so even if there's these rogue actors, uh, I think uh, having the, the, forcing the district to contract with the most responsible uh, parties uh, will keep uh, the standards uniform and keep uh, them coming. We, uh, we are not concerned that this will have uh, any dampening effect on the number of teachers that come. In fact, we think it'll help increase them because uh, a lot of these uh, individuals are, are, quite frankly, hoodwinked, uh, brought to a place, um, uh, and in situations that are that are pretty bad. And I, I did want to condemn or commend the Clark County School District. They recently stood up for our J-1 teachers. They filed a lawsuit on this, and uh, they recognize how important that these teachers are um, for this. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, uh, anyone else here in Carson City, in Las Vegas, on the phone lines, BPS when you're ready. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you very much. Those in opposition here in Carson City, Las Vegas, on the phone lines, BPS when you're ready. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Go ahead, please, when you're ready. Thank you. Good evening. Patricia Haddad, uh, Director of Government Relations for the Clark County School District. Um, grateful to the sponsor and certainly, you know, much appreciation to the educators that are in the Clark County School District on J-1 visas. Um, I think, you know, at this point the, the, the big question is, you know, putting this hard number, 5,000, into the legislation, recognizing that that cost will increase over time. Um, but overall, you know, we are, are supportive of, of the concept and, and look forward to having additional conversations with the sponsor. Thank so you. are you in support? No. Not at this time. Patricia had it. So neutral? You're in opposition. You're, yeah. you're in opposition? I just want to confirm because at the very end you said we look forward to having more conversations and it sort of sounded like you were. Patricia Haddad. Respectfully, I am up in opposition. Thank you. Because there okay. are changes that That's need to be made. That's what I needed to know because your you. conversation wasn't clear. So thank you very much. M Madam Chair, can I, may, may I ask a question? Yes, you may. Yeah. How, how much are you currently paying for this recruitment? Patricia Haddad, I am have a question out to my folks to get uh, a sense of what the range is. I do know that some of them are as low as 5000 but that the cost can exceed from there. And uh, the information that I'm trying to grab right now is how many um, teachers are, or how many uh, educators on the J-1 visa um, would be cut out if this limitation was at 5000 And then the other question I have is when those, that you, you have a contract with one of these organizations, um, is Clark County School District solely responsible for the cost, or do they also put, put the cost on the um, employee themselves? Because I think that that was brought up by one of my colleagues. It doesn't necessarily preclude them from charging the employee themselves, or do the contracts that you put together require that just Clark County pays for, uh, for that? Patricia had, and my understanding is that there are costs associated with both the individual and with the, that the school uh, that the school district also through contracting with. Uh, there are three different companies that we contract with that are sponsors, um, and so you know, looking at this legislation in particular, recognizing that it's looking at the charge to the individual and uh, the district's inability to be able to contract with those uh, uh, those sponsorship companies if they are charging those those other folks above and beyond that five thousand dollar cost. For their sponsorship thank you do you have so so why so with that question i'm a little confused why this would be an issue if you're paying five thousand right now or more and you're contracting why would this be an issue because you'd still be paying the five thousand and not you, but the Clark County School District. Certainly, Patricia had it. So uh, the only concern is how this might impact the total pool of individuals that we are able to to bring into the to the district. So if there is a cutoff and a limitation on the total amount of educators that are coming in based on this new state law that would limit uh, recruitment, essentially, right? Because you're looking at limiting the cost of what folks are able to charge. Um, then the question therein is is how many um, educators we might not be able to access from that pool um, based on this limitation and the amount 
uh, of what, who we're able to contract with based on how much they're charging the individuals. Okay, well, forgive my ignorance on this then, but it seems to me if I need 30 educators from that are J1 teachers and I can do $5,000 a piece, it's 5,000 times 30, right? I don't see how that's different if you, unless some other company is charging you more and you're using that other company, I, I don't get where the difference is. I mean, it seems like a simple math lesson to me, but I'm just an educator. Patricia Haddad, thank you. The locus of control falls with, with the sponsorship companies and the total amount that they're able to charge. So there's a distance, right, between our ability. So because the companies are in total control of what they're charging, we are at the whim, right, of what they ultimately end up charging. And so certainly appreciate that this would um, essentially sort of force the market, right, to put that limitation, um, but recognizing that, you know, if there are other companies that we are currently contracting with that don't want to drop their rate down to align with this, that that would impact the total pool of, of educators that we're able to access. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry, don't leave. Senator Gokachia. Uh, thank you, and I'll be really brief, but and I'm somewhat familiar with the H-2A visa program is, that we use. But again, the way I read this bill, you're, you're, the dis school district is capped at the $5,000. There is nothing that stops you from negotiating, and typically this is a case with some H-2As, especially uh, Peruvian sheep herders and whatever. You've got to pay airfare and, you know, all those things to get them here. And so that typically would be negotiated. This is just saying... The school district can only pay 5000 the way I see it. Do you have a comment to that? Yeah, I, I, I guess I, I, and I'll speak for all of us, and maybe if I'm not clear, I think that what we're, com I think in my mind anyway, what I'm confused about is, once again, if you're bringing 30 teachers here and you negotiate a different deal, you negotiate a different deal. But what we're saying is she can't charge the teacher more than $5,000. So you might pay 15, I don't know. But if you're gonna ask for a J1 teacher to come teach in Las Vegas, Nevada, you have to pay the 5,000. And maybe the Senator can come up in a minute and clarify that, but that's the way I'm reading the bill. So I'm not sure. Uh, Senator Neal? Um, Madam Chair, I don't, I don't see this as a limitation on the actual candidate itself. I see it as a limitation on what the school district can pay. Like, I feel like this bill doesn't actually protect the candidate. Someone could come in and charge, you know, $15,000 and the district would be capped at five and then they could potentially pass on additional fees to the candidate. I don't know what the district is trying to work out on this bill, but if it's not protecting the J-1 person, you're probably moving in the wrong direction. Because I, it, are you going to come to this? <laughs> She's in opposition, so oh, okay. he, he kind, she can. kind of, need, we well, need to finish asking Ms. Haddad what questions we had for the school district. I was just trying to get it clear what, what the school district was actually charging the teacher. You know, I didn't want the, I guess in my mind, I didn't want the school district saying, oh, we want you to come as a J-1 teacher, but we're going to charge you $5,000 and we're going to charge her fifteen dollars because we use two different companies, right? Mm -hmm. That's where I was going with my question. Uh, All right, thank you so can, much. Can I ask one more question before yes. she goes? Okay. Yes. When, when you contract with organizations, you have three organizations, Do you in those contracts, can you require um, or cap what the total amount is so that maybe this Clark County School District part is 5000 but then you cap what was paid by the J-1 applicant. Patricia Haddad, I do not know the answer to that question, but I will find okay, out and get thank back you. to you. Thank you. Hang on. Senator Harris. Hi. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So... Given that this whole the whole idea of this program is to bring in teachers, it seems to me if the fifth largest school district in the country 
is not allowed to enter into a contract for more than $5,000 that may move the market, as opposed to cutting out the availability of teachers because you won't be able to negotiate a price um, below that. It, your testimony, however, indicates that maybe you have some concern that you wouldn't be able to get the teachers. And so could you just maybe speak to the market power CCSD may have and whether you think you all, if we have a specifically a law that says CCSD can enter into a contract, whether that might actually drive prices down. Thank you, Senator. Patricia had it. It, it certainly could. Hang on. Senator Neal, do you have another comment? I, don't, I, I, I probably shouldn't say anything. <laughs> this is all, it's all bad when you make it to eight. Um, <laughs> we had a hearing on this in Senate Ed, right? And so some of the same, well, you were opposed then, but you were opposed to different pieces. But weren't, I just don't understand why you don't have answers to certain questions, because this isn't the first rodeo on this bill, right? J1 has been in this bill. And I don't, from what I see in 308, even the amendments still had this language in the back, right? This is the first reprint. So, I mean, I guess it's, we always, we never ask you questions, right? So we just let you go and say, I oppose yada, 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 and then you go back and sit down. But there had to have been some thought and conversation on this bill, because it wasn't dead. So why don't you have any answers on this bill that has been around since March 20th? Thank you, Senator. Patricia Haddad. Um, I think the, on, the only real answer to that is about 20 minutes before walking in here, I realized that it was on the agenda for today. I was going back and pulling the information that I had received and realized that there was a, uh, some, some additional questions that, that I had. Um, and then, of course, in addition to the questions that you all have posed here, you know, I am certainly not an expert in this area of J-1 educator, you know, J-1 visas and, and, and educator recruitment. And so, um, you know, the best that I can offer you is, is to certainly follow up with, with the answers to the questions that you've posed and, uh, you know, immediately, as immediately as possible. And um, that's, that's what I've got for you. Any other comments, questions? Okay, thank you very much. All right. Um, any other opposition here in Carson City? Any opposition in Las Vegas? Any opposition on the phone lines, BPS, when you're ready? I don't know if we finished up there. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time, Chair. Thank you very much. Neutral here in Carson City, Las Vegas. On the phone lines, BPS, when you're ready. There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Thank you very much. All right, with that, we will, uh, any closing remarks, Senator Flores, you might wanna answer a couple questions. Senator Edgar Flores, for the record, and uh, thank you all for the question. And to be fair to uh, Ms. Hatta, we spoke maybe a minute before coming into the hearing. I, I did not give her a heads up. We were having a conversation about this tonight. Um, and I also committed to continue to work with her. So just for the sake of clarity, I live in the Philippines, and somebody as a third party says to me, uh, you have this resume, you're an excellent candidate for the way we've structured it for you to be a teacher in Nevada. And I'm just going to paint the ideal scenario. You'd be a great teacher. We charge $5,000 for you to do this paperwork. You're gonna to go to Las Vegas, you're gonna be a teacher there, you're gonna to go to Reno, you're gonna be a teacher there. Um, prior to that having occurred, the school district will have had reached out and set up a relationship with that particular company, saying we're gonna be the sponsor. 
we're the sponsor. I ha the school district has to sign off on a bunch of things in order for that relationship to exist. That third party is just somebody that's like a broker. They're just setting up the relationship between the teacher uh, who has the required resume and the school district. Eventually, they'll come here and they'll, s they'll set up what school they're going to go to. What we are saying is we recognize that with the folk they contract, and, and CCSD, you know, they mentioned they have three folk, three brokers. Some of them were charging like 15K. Some of them were charging 5K. And it doesn't make sense because they're doing the same exact thing. So in my opinion, and I am saying this out loud, the fact that we're charging $15,000 for some teachers, and this is charged to the teacher, and another teacher paid $5,000, went through the same exact paperwork, the same exact dance, to me, there is something that is in balance with that. And when you research that nationwide, we have this problem where, in my opinion, we are taking advantage or exploiting teachers. If we create a blanket rule saying we're charging 5000 we already have that broker that does that. In my opinion, you're going to bring out cost, and you're going to be able to probably get more teachers. Because in my opinion, the reason we haven't increased the number is because some of our partners that were the brokerage firms that we're using are charging like 15 k If you're at 5 k I believe that we would have more teachers that could afford that because the, the, the own the, the responsibility is on the teacher what we're charging them. Um, but I think, and, and, it, and just to provide some clarity to the, the opposition that was brought forth, she's suggesting, and her, her concern is, if there's a firm that charges 15 k but now that we have this $5,000 rule and that firm no longer wants to do it because they charge 15 they don't want to do it for 5 their concern is that maybe that firm um, won't attract any more teachers and maybe we'll lose out. My opposition and my pushback to that is if we're all charging the same amount and there's 400 just in Clark County, there's absolutely people that are going to want to do this work because it's 400 times $5,000 that you're charging and you're replicating. It is a paper mill. I had my own staff go through it, not a trained lawyer. So I went through them. It took one person in my staff who's not an, a, a trained lawyer, just a paralegal. It took them three hours to prepare one application. We went through the whole dance. Um, Non-lawyer, one time. Now imagine just replicating that process every single time. In my opinion, that's why we're saying this is absurd that we're charging them this much money you're, when you're replicating the paperwork. However, I do, and I have said this, and, and I'll repeat it, that I will uh, work a little bit here just with the language to say if there's a growth of 3% on that per year or whatever we want to do, that's perfectly fine. I understand that um, as the, the market may fluctuate with time. And I pray that one day we, don't, we no longer need other teachers from other countries to save us because we can't fill the void ourselves. But that's, that's down the road, and we're still in a desperate uh, stage as a state. And until we get there and if we're going to continue to utilize these teachers, I, I think a way we can say thank you to them as a state is by saying, we know there's a firm that can bring you for 5000 We've done it before or less. Let's please set a market, uh, 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 an amount in, in the market of Nevada that we're not going to partner up with anybody who we believe is taking advantage of this situation and, and, and in my opinion, charging you an ex excessive amount of money when another firm is doing it for much less. So I guess, um, and, and not to rehear the bill, but I guess I'm confused because I understand uh, what Ms. Haddad was saying, but I feel like if you're contracting, like if a school district, and it doesn't matter what school district, is contracting with a company, you know, it's no different what, who you contract with for whatever service. You contract with them for a certain amount. So if a school district says, I'm going to contract with a company for $5,000, and that's all I'm going to pay for that, I don't care if it's books. If you say I'm going to buy 500 you know, library books at $100 a piece or 500 biology books at $100 a piece, it doesn't matter what it is. You have a contract. Mm -hmm. So why would the teacher actually be paying anything because it wouldn't the contract be between the school district and the and their contracting because they want them to bring teachers i get that there could be a um 
illegal part to that that we can't control, but we may never be able to control that. Agreed. So if a, so, the school district would be responsible for the contract. So if they decide to pay $10,000 a teacher to a company, they, they are in charge of that contract. So it's a little difficult for us to say you can only contract for 5000 in a way because, I mean, if every school district only could find someone to do it for eight thousand dollars i don't know right I don't, I don't know exactly how that works thank you for that question senator edgar flores for for the record if we can just go step back for a second we are presently now contracting with at least one of the partners at that amount or less that's already happening but there's also additional firms that they're using that are an, an excessive amount beyond that. Um, and, and, and the way it's working now is the, the school district isn't capping that firm any amount presently as, as it sits. They hire them and said, look, please go help identify 100 teachers, in this case right around 375 for CCSD. Go find them for us. They come back and say, here, we have these candidates. And there's very specific things that, the, as a school district, you're focused on the training they have, any type of technical expertise, do they speak English, X, Y, Z. That's what you're focusing on, and you require that they have that resume. But presently, as a school district, we are not, no school district in, in Nevada is saying, you have to, uh, and on top of making sure they have certain qualifications, you also have to charge them this amount. That, that, that number has been set by whatever amount that particular brokerage firm wants to charge. So some of them, as we've said, they, some folk paid 15 plus, 10K plus, and then we realized that some folk were paying 5K or less. So what we are saying is the school district, let's do an added layer of protection, and when you shake the hands of these firms that are gonna bring you folk from other countries to be J1 teachers, on top of saying, I want, you, I want them to have these, uh, this resume, we, we're also telling you that we're not going to work with you if you're charging them th this excessive amount of money. And that's, uh, and that's, where, what we're, that's our ask. Uh, and, and, we're, and that's based off of what they are currently contracting with. Uh, we realize that, that it, it can be done. It is being done. They have a partner that does that. Uh, if we now say that that's the bar, the entire state of Nevada, then our partners who are going to do this work are going to have to do it at that price if they want to be partners with us. Just like the partners, we already have some of them that can do it. We're just saying we want all of you to do it, if they want to be a partner with us. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So, so when I read the bill, you're, you're capping only one side of the equation. And I'm kind of wondering if this is more of a transparency issue, if there was required reporting for what these contracts look like, you know, how much are there. And they don't, not like per person, but like aggregate, that may help you get um, a better feel for the market and it may change the market if there's transparency around what's the total cost because again there's at least two sides of it um, and this legislation as presented I don't think gets you there because if the cost is 15000 and we cap the CCSD side then the individual could be paying ten, and so we don't know what the total cost is and so if there's transparency around the total cost because I don't think you can limit the contracts like what somebody else pays, but we could get some transparency around that, and that may that may help you. But I, I think there's a further concern that um, if you if you have significant restrictions, then maybe we just don't get those employees, those J-1 visa holders, right? And and it sounds like there's they have 375 right now, and they probably want more. So thank you. And if I may just respond, Madam Chair, Senator Edgar Flores, for the record. Uh, my opinion is that it, if we set it at 5000 it actually goes in the other direction because now more teachers can afford to pay that, um, number one. And number two, um, the transparency part, the only way we can mandate a contract is what we tell the school districts what to do. We can't say anybody who's doing a J-1 uh, in the state of Nevada has to do it at X, Y, and Z. All we can do is cap it on the side of the, the, the good partners, right, which is the school district, them saying, if you want, if you want, to, want me to be the sponsor, because the school district must be the sponsor and sign off on it. 
If you want me to do that, the only way I'm going to do that is if we're at this cap. In addition to that, we, have, we do have access to some of these contracts. The J-1 teachers have provided us their contracts, which is how we realized that there is this dramatically, uh, 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 this horrible, uh, 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 dramatic difference in what one person paid versus the other, because we saw their contract. Um, and we, that's when we realized, oh, wait a minute, why, why, what was that discrepancy? And we realized that it was based on just who that, who that broker happened to be for that particular J-1. Thank you, but, but I keep hearing you say that the teacher paid the amount. That's correct. You keep saying the teacher paid the amount, but what you're limiting is what the school district can pay. No, uh, I'm sorry. I want to clarify that. Senator Edgar Flores, for the record. The school contracts with a business to bring the teacher. The teacher always pays. The school district is not paying that 5K. The reason we're saying 5K is because we want the school district, when they're shaking hands, to establish that relationship with that third-party company that they're telling them, the only way we're going to allow you to be a supplier of teachers to us is if on top of bringing me a teacher with this resume, you're also bringing me a teacher that you're not charging any more than 5K. Okay, so that's, that's what I don't see in this bill. I see that you're saying the school district can only pay 5K, but it doesn't say that the employee cannot pay anything in addition to that amount, that that's the, the, the total fee for the service for both sides. So... That's and, and Madam Chair, Senator Flores, for the record, again, we can't we can't cap what a con we can't say you, you can't have a contract in the Philippines or in some other country for X amount. We can't say that. We just can't create that under state law. The only thing we're in control of is what we're asking the school districts to do. So the school district is we're asking the school district to be responsible right. for the amount of money that. They're contracting with somebody to bring somebody to this okay, state. Thank you. All right. Uh, Senator Gokichio. Yes, I, I think we're just confused. As long as you're comparing apples to apples, it's fine. The 5K from the school district and, and that you're saying, okay, hey, if, if you're going to do the paperwork, this is, this is all we're going to pay. This is what it costs. You set it up and deliver it, and I can understand that. But there are also the, the other incremental costs that could be out there. Again, whether this broker is going to pay the airfare to get them here, uh, you know, and those things, and they have to be negotiated on the side. And, and clearly, it, like, let's like say it's whatever. There has to be another arrangement. I know where you're headed, but you're just saying, okay, if you want to partner with us, Clark County School District, the max we're going to pay to do this paperwork and make the introduction is $5,000. Yes. Senator Edgar Flores, for the record, that's it. We're just saying for that, all you're going to do is charge them 5000 Of course, air, airfare is separate. Um, housing is separate. All that is not in the equation. We're just talking about specifically this paperwork that we already have a partner that that's what they charge. We have those contracts. We have access to them. We just want to make sure that those folk uh, who are paying 5000 is what we're now saying we're all going to do as a state versus having some folk who paid fifteen. All righty, I think we've asked some questions, so we need some answers. So with that, we'll close the hearing on uh, Senate Bill 308. Thank you very much for all that information. And uh, we will move on to our work session. Ms. Crockett, when you're ready. Kathy Crockett, Fiscal Analysis Division. Senate Bill 163 was heard in committee on May 23rd. It requires certain health insurance policies, including Nevada Medicaid, to provide coverage for the treatment of conditions relating to gender dysphoria and gender incongruence, allows insurance to establish requirements for coverage of surg surgical treatments for individuals under 18 years old, and prohibits insurers from engaging in discrimination based on gender identity or expression. The bill becomes effective on July 1st, 2023. The bill was presented by Senator Scheibel and there were no amendments discussed at the bill hearing. The Department of Health and Human Services Division of Healthcare Financing and Policy submitted a fiscal note on the bill 
indicating a fiscal impact of 1.3 million in fiscal year 2024, of which $182,426 would be general fund. And this would include medical service costs, actuarial rate setting, and information system changes. Uh, the 2025 cost would be 1.3 million, including $182,654 in general fund. Um, various fiscal notes for local um, government indicated that uh, the fiscal impact could not be determined. There were four individuals who provided, or three individuals who provided um, comments in support of the bill. Several individuals provided comments in opposition, including Nevada Families for Freedom, the Independent American Party, the Libertarian Party, and there were um, no comments in neutral on the bill. If the committee wishes to take action on the bill, an appropriate motion would be to amend and do pass with um, general funds and federal fund authorization to support the Medicaid budget. All right, any questions? All right, I will accept a motion to amend and do pass. Thank you very much. Uh, from Senator Wynn, second from Senator uh, Harris. Uh, we're going to take a one minute recess. We're missing a person. Hang on. Okay, we have a, we're back in. We'll take the motion from Senator Wynn, a second from Senator Harris. Any discussion on the motion? All right, with that, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Nay. nay from Senator Titus, Senator Gokachia, and Senator Gansert. All right, with that, um, motion passes, and I will give the floor statement to Senator Scheibel. All righty, we will, uh, Mr. Thorley, when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. Wayne Thorley for the record, LCB Fiscal Analysis Division. Senate Bill 225 first reprint was heard yesterday in this committee and was presented by us. Uh, um, Senator Harris, the bill as amended requires an application um, for certification as a peace officer to include an affidavit stating that the applicant is not disqualified from serving as a peace officer, has not been discharged, disciplined, or has to resign from employment with a law enforcement agency for certain misconduct and has not resigned from employment or otherwise separated from employment with a law enforcement agency while investigating investigation concerning certain alleged misconduct was pending. 
The bill also requires the law enforcement agency to immediately notify the Peace Officer Standards and Training Commission or POST if a peace officer is charged with certain crimes or separates from employment while an investigation concerning alleged misconduct is pending. The bill also provides that a person is not qualified to serve as a peace officer if the person has been convicted of domestic violence in this state or any other state. The bill also prohibits a law enforcement agency from using officers use of cannabis as a condition of employment. Finally, the bill requires a search of the National Decertification Index or an equivalent database to ensure that the name of an applicant does not appear in any such index or database. It requires post to report to the index the name of each decertified peace officer in the state. Um, regarding the fiscal impact of the bill, there uh, as amended uh, and there are updated fiscal notes uh, on Nellis. There are no uh, fiscal notes from uh, any state agencies. There was um, testimony, there was no testimony of support opposition or neutral. Senator Harris did present a, a conceptual amendment at the bill hearing. Uh, the amendment is available on Nellis. Uh, it would make a small change to section two or section three sub two of the bill. So on page four, uh, starting on line four, uh, would make a would strike out any information requested uh, to and uh, replace it with the words the adjudication to, and then would strike out receiving the request and replace with completing the investigation. Uh, the am amendment uh, has would not affect the the or would not change the no fiscal impact on the bill. Um, if the committees wish to move the bill, uh, the appropriate motion would and with the amendment would be to amend and do pass. Thank you very much. Any discussion on this particular bill? All right, seeing none, I'll accept a motion. So moved by Senator Wynn, second by Senator Canizaro. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say nay. nay. Uh, Senator uh, Titus. All right, motion passes. Uh, and I'll give the floor statement to Senator Harris. All right, um, just a one minute recess real quick here. Thank you very much, and we will go to Senate Bill 342. Thank you, Madam Chair. Wayne Thorley again for the record, LCB Fiscal Analysis Division. Senate Bill 342 was also heard yesterday in this committee and was presented uh, by Senator uh, Guaycuchia and Dr. Michael Teglis and uh, Patty Porter with uh, Witchy. The bill uh, exempts a participant who receives a stipend from the uh, from Witchy uh, from completing employment ob obligations uh, if the participant who receives a stipend participates in a program to earn a, doc a degree of uh, doctor of veterinary medicine. The bill provides general fund appropriations of $8 million to Wichi to enter into contract with Utah State University for a program to provide stipends for out-of-state tuition of 70 Nevada residents to earn a degree of doctor of veterinary medicine uh, from the College of Veter Me Veterinary Medicine at Utah State University. The bill also provides a general fund appropriation of approximately $80,000 in FY24 and approximately $76,000 in FY25 uh, to Wichi for one new program officer position and associated operating costs to assist Wichi in carrying out uh, the provisions of this bill. Um, the, uh, there was testimony and support from the Nevada Veterinary Association, the Nevada System of Higher Education, the Humane Society, Nevada Farm Bureau, the Nevada Faculty Alliance, and the University of Nevada, Reno. There was no testimony in opposition or neutral. The fiscal impact uh, uh, just relates to the two general fund appropriations in a bill. Again, the $8 million um, that would uh, pay for um, 
70 students, uh, Nevada residents, to attend uh, veterinary school at Utah State University. If all students uh, completed uh, the course through graduation, that would be that would be 70 students. Um, I know there was some discussion about the number of slots, um, but that, that's the total number of students that, that would be funded through the program. Uh, there was discussion uh, at the committee about um, how the agreement between Wichi and uh, Utah State University would look. Uh, Wichi testified that they are still in the preliminary phase of uh, negotiating that agreement and having discussions with Utah State. Uh, if the committee uh, has a desire to uh, appropriate general funds for this purpose, the committee may wish to appropriate the general funds to the IFC uh, contingency account, restricted portion of the contingency account, and then uh, instruct uh, Wichi to come to IFC uh, during the interim after the legislature adjourns, uh, and after Wichi and Utah State University have been able to negotiate agreement, uh, and then uh, present that to uh, IFC, and then request for approval uh, to transfer funds from the contingency account to the agency uh, for the purposes of um, the the agreement. Uh, that would also apply to the funding for the new program officer position, which would only be required uh, if the funding for the program is approved. Happy to answer any questions that the committee members might have. All right, Senator Gokachia. Thank you. Just a clarification. Uh, a couple of things I think we need to clear up. Uh, the 70, it says 70 students, that's, but again, that's actually 100 slots. It's going to graduate 70. That's why we're going the 10 year period, I, I believe. You know, it takes the first three years, you're not going to graduate anybody. Yes. So it still will place those students. I, I just want to make sure it's clear. It kind of sounds like we're. You're only graduating 70. 70, right, but they have to attend three years at the reduced rate in order to get that fourth year. And uh, yeah, and, and then I'm definitely fine with the the amendment. Uh, I damn sure don't want to negotiate the contract and we make sure we have a good solid MOU or contract in place. And I think it will benefit Nevada. So that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. We, we just felt like, you know, since uh, that agreement had not been done, that it was a much better place to put it with IFC and contingency funds. And that way, um, that money will be safe, if you will, until we know what the agreements are. You don't want to trust me with $8 million, I know. <laughs> well, you know, Senator, we trust you, but we'd like to have a contract. All right, any additional questions? All right, with that, um, I'll accept an amend and do pass on Senate Bill 3. 42, Senator Titus, second from uh, Senator uh, Gansert. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion passes. And Senator Gokachia, I will give you the floor statement. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, committee. Okay, we're on to Senate Bill 350. Kathy Crockett, Fiscal Analysis Division. Senate Bill 350 was heard in this committee on May 12th. It requires the Office of Science, Innovation, and Technology, OSIT, to establish the Graduate Medical Education Grant Program toward grants to institutions seeking to create, expand, or retain accredited programs for residency training and postdoctoral fellowships for physicians and creates the account for a graduate medical education grant program to carry out the program. Um, the bill also creates the advisory council on graduate medical education to make recommend recommendations to OSIT on grants for the program. The bill becomes effective upon passage and approval. The bill was presented by Senator Pazina and the Dean of the UNLV School of Medicine. Um, support was provided um, by Toro University, Renown, the Nevada Public Health Association, Nevada, Nevada System of Higher Education, Vegas Chamber and Sunrise Health, University of Nevada, Reno, 
Nevada Primary Care Association. Um, there were no comments in opposition. There was one comment in neutral from the Administrative Services Division discussing the fiscal note, um, which was um, a cost of $89,000 in fiscal year uh, 2024 and $113,000 in fiscal year 2025 to administer the program. The bill also does include a $17 million general fund appropriation to the Account for Graduate Medical Education grant program. Um, however, um, one staff was funded in the OSIP budget in closings, um, so the Administrative Services Division indicated that there was no longer a need for additional staff removing that particular portion of the fiscal note. Um, Senator Pizzina did provide an amendment to staff on May 24th. Um, the amendment includes a reduction in Section 9 of the appropriation of 17 million to 8.5 million. The OSIT budget, as approved by the legislature, um, does also contain um, $8.5 million in funding to support the GME grant program, as approved. Um, the amendment also proposes in um, Section Five to require the Office of Science, Innovation, and Technology to convene an evaluation committee of subject matter experts that are unaffiliated with any applicants for funding to develop a process and procedure um, so that um, all awards are um, transparent, without bias, fair, equitable, and accessible. Um, the amendment also proposes to establish a tax credit against the modified business tax for taxpayers who donate money to an organization that provides grants to public or private institutions for the establishment of certain programs of residency, training, and postdoctoral fellowships for physicians. If the committee wishes to take action on the bill, um, the appropriate motion would be to um, amend and do pass um, and consider various pieces of the amendment proposed by Senator Pizzina. Thank you very much. Senator Titus. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, I definitely support this uh, bill. I support um, the amendment also. Um, I, I, I applaud again uh, Senator uh, Pazina to be willing to work with many uh, people involved in this to try to bring the best thing we could possibly bring forward for um, GME in the state of Nevada. Um, part of this amendment was something that I had in, in one, my bill and uh, I really appreciate um, the thought and uh, again I appreciate her uh, working with me. Thank you. All right, so um, I actually um, have a conceptual amendment for, amendment for Senate Bill 350, and I would suggest that uh, we amend and do pass with number two. Um, everybody has a copy of this in front of them. Section 5.3, uh, addition, require the Office of Science, Innovation, and Technology to convene an evaluation committee on subject matter experts that are unaffiliated with any applicants for funding to develop a process and procedure and rubric for evaluating evaluation so that the process and all procedures are transparent without bias, fair, equitable, and accessible. And then um, hopefully um, at some point we'll be able to fund this uh, Senate bill. Um, we love all the concepts, but um, Right now, it is it is very expensive, and so what we'd like to do is to um, have that evaluation committee put into place. So I'll accept a motion with amend and do pass with number two as the amendment. So moved from Senator Wynn and Senator. So, Madam Chair, so we're we're just we're uh, no money, fixing, just yeah, the, fixing the policy, not put the money in right yes, now. Yes, just the policy. Okay. Thanks. Yes. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second from Senator Canizaro. Any discussion on the motion? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. Motion. Senator Titus and motion passes and uh, Senator Pizzina I will give you the floor statement and thank you for being here this week, evening. Alrighty with that we will go to Senate Bill 3 or 413.
Thank you, Madam Chair. Wayne Thorley for the record, LCB Fiscal Analysis Division. Senate Bill 413, first reprint, uh, was presented by Senator Harris on uh, yesterday. The bill, everything was yesterday. The bill provides that certain offenders who comply with the programming and uh, placement identified in the risk and needs assessment and administered to the offender as determined by the director must be al uh, allowed credit against the minimum term or minimum aggregate term and the maximum term or maximum aggregate term as applicable of his or her sentence for good behavior in an amount of days that is equivalent to 35% of the applicable term of the sentence of the offender. The bill also requires the director of the Department of Corrections to provide each offender a list of programs identified in the risk and need assessment, the programs available at the institution the offender is assigned, and which, the, and which of the programs identified in the risk and need assessment are available at the institution the offender is assigned I think I just said that. <laughs> it's okay. It's I'm been struggling. a long day. <laughs> I just had a root canal today. <laughs> Although I'm feeling good. True story. <laughs> um, where am I? And submit to the board a report listing the programs provided to each offender in custody and the programs the offender su successfully completed. Upon pass, uh, the effective date is passage and approval for the uh, purposes of adopting regulations and performing uh, administrative preparatory tasks. And then on January 1, 2025, for all other purposes. Uh, regarding the fiscal impact, uh, the Attorney General uh, submitted a, uh, an unsolicited fiscal note. However, it was testified uh, at the bill hearing that the uh, proposed uh, mock up amendment, which uh, all members should have a copy of, uh, remove the fiscal impact on the Attorney General's office. Um, there is also a fiscal note from the Department of Corrections related to funding for one new position and then uh, programming costs uh, for a vendor to uh, implement uh, information technology system changes. Um, the Fiscal Analysis Division has received updated information from the Department of Corrections the total estimated uh, fiscal cost um, in FY24 is $353,721. That is made up of $300,000 in IT costs and then $53,721 in personnel costs for the caseworker management specialist position. And then in FY25, $74,198. In, uh, for personnel costs. Uh, there was testimony provided in support from a formerly incarcerated individual. There was no testimony in opposition or neutral. Uh, as I previously noted, there was an amendment uh, presented at the bill hearing. It is uh, amendment number 3704 uh, to SB 413 that is available on Nellis. And again, that does remove the uh, Attorney General's fiscal note. Uh, the amendment also requires a report to be submitted to the IFC um, no later than December 31st, 2024, on the implementation of the, of the, uh, the new credits program and then um, addresses the uh, um, information sharing between Department of Corrections and the Attorney General's office, which again removes the fiscal note. Um, if the committee wishes to add funding uh, to the bill, it would be general fund appropriations uh, to fund the IT system upgrades in the position and also to uh, add, uh, amend in the provisions of the mock-up. Happy to answer any questions that the committee members might have. All right, any questions on this particular bill? Senator Gokachia. I just need to get, and this is more policy than the fiscal side, but uh, it's my understanding, though, even with this new floating up down, uh, starting at 35%, of, in the end, it's still the parole board that grants the parole. It, it doesn't matter how many points you got up, down, sideways, you still have to go to the parole board. Wayne Thorley, for the record, LCB Fiscal Analysis. That is our understanding. Senator Harris, Senator Harris when she presented this bill, indicated that, that, that nothing in this bill changes that process. That those, uh, they would, this, the parole board would still receive all the information related to the offender and then make the decision regarding parole. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. With that, I'll accept a motion. 
So moved from uh, Senator Wynn, second from Senator Canizaro. And uh, any discussion on the motion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say nay. Aye. Nay from Senator Titus. And uh, the motion passes and I'll give the uh, statement to Senator Harris. Okay, Senate Bill 416. Kathy Crockett, Fiscal Analysis Division. Senate Bill 416 was heard on committee on May 23rd. The bill limits the director of the Department of Corrections Authority to deduct money, allowing deductions only for medical expenses related to injuries caused by offenders to other offenders and for medical care provided outside of the facility. Deductions for clothing, transportation, and money upon release are prohibited for offenders with certain sentences. The bill also establishes requirements for the provision of funds upon a an offender's release and regulates the operation of commissaries regarding the package program for offenders. Additionally, it provides the director of the department the authority to adopt regulations regarding the handling of an offender's remains and cancels outstanding debt for certain released offenders. The bill is effective upon passage and approval for administrative preparatory tasks as on, on October 1st, 2023 for all other purposes. Um, the bill was presented um, by Senator Scheibel accompanied by individuals from the Nevada Fines and Fees uh, Justice Center. Um, there was an amendment discussed which all senators should have on your desks. So this is an update um, provided on uh, May 29th. The amendment would amend uh, section uh, three, subsection one of the bill to um, allow the director of the Department of Corrections to adopt regulations relating to limiting amounts of personal property um, and clarify um, the markup in subsection B regarding hygiene items. It would amend um, section Two, indicating that the director shall not adopt any regulation which authorizes a deduction of money credited to the count of the offender for medical copays for routine and emergency medical care, and to strike the rest of that um, section in the bill in its current form. Um, it would also keep section eight and then delete all other sections and subsections of the bill. Regarding the fiscal impact, the bill as introduced, um, indicated a $12.2 million net revenue um, reduction over the biennium. Um, the agency has provided fiscal staff with revised um, estimates based on the proposed amendment that was just discussed, and that would result in um, a de revenue decrease of $1,308,472 per fiscal year of which 482,899 relates to decreased room and board revenue. Um, the revenue source available to offset that revenue loss would be general fund. And the other component relates to charges um, collected for medical co-pays and that's broken down into two components which um, total $825,573 per fiscal year. Um, the committee has a couple of options to consider um, regarding that particular component of the um, fiscal impact. Um, that could be um, supported by transfers from the inmate welfare fund. However, that fund is um, supported primarily by fees uh, charged to offenders, which is somewhat um, not in alignment with the um, intent of the bill to reduce the cost of incarceration for individuals and their family. And the other option would be to support that um, medical um, charge cost with general funds, which would bring total general funds to the $1.3 million um, previously mentioned. Um, there were nine individuals who testified in support of the bill. No individuals testified in um, opposition or neutral. If the committee um, wishes to take action on the bill, the um, action would be to amend and do pass and then to specify the funding sources to offset the revenue loss to the Department of Corrections.
any discussion on this bill? Okay, with that, I would accept an amend and do pass with um, a general fund. So moved from Senator Wynn, second from Senator Canizaro. Um, any discussion on that bill or on that motion? I'm sorry. Senator Gansert. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to be a no for now. Thanks. Madam Chair, I, just a kind of a ballpark total general fund appropriation. Ms. Crockett. The total general fund appropriation would be $1,308,472 per fiscal year. Okay, any additional discussion? All right, with that, I'll, I have a motion, so I will, um, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Uh, Senator Titus, Senator Gokachia, Senator Gansert, our noes. Motion passes, and I will um, give the floor statement to the senator in the front row. Okay, we are on to Senate Bill 425. Wayne Thorley for the record, LCB Fiscal Analysis Division. Senate Bill 425 was heard in this committee on May 12th. Uh, the bill creates a com the Commission on Innovation and Excellence in Education to develop a statewide vision and implementation plan to improve uh, Nevada's education system. The bill lists out uh, the uh, activities that the commission must undertake. Uh, the commission must submit an annual report of its findings to the governor, superintendent of public instruction, and the legislature. Um, there is a general fund appropriation. Uh, there's two general fund appropriations in the bill. Uh, section six appropriates $250,000 to the commission uh, to uh, contract with a vendor to assist with the uh, work of the commission in its statutory duties. Um, in section five, there's a general fund appropriation of $12,500 in each year of the biennium uh, to pay cover uh, travel expenses for the commission members. Uh, those um, are the only general fund appropriations uh, in the bill. Uh, the Department of Education did submit a fiscal note indicating costs of approximately $10,000 per year uh, in overtime costs for staff related to uh, work uh, surrounding the commission, uh, this new commission. Um, the, uh, there was support testimony provided by the City of Henderson, opposition from the Nevada State Education Association, and no testimony in neutral. There were no amendments um, uh, discussed at the bill hearing, and staff is not, uh, not aware of any subsequent uh, amendments. If the committee wishes to move this bill, uh, they have a couple options. Uh, they could fund um, the projected overtime cost of the Department of Education. However, staff notes that the legislature uh, historically does not budget for overtime. Um, the committee could also uh, just do pass the bill with the general fund appropriation in the bill and not address the uh, projected overtime costs of the Department of Education. Happy to answer any questions that the committee members might have. Any discussion? Senator Gokachia. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I know it's getting late, but I'm just waking up. Uh, anyway, <laughs> this commission, would it be, uh, you know, on innovation and excellence in education, but would it be able to, I guess I'd be interested if it was going to take a look at Clark County School District and see if we can figure out if there is a better way to deliver uh, public education in Clark County? I mean, I'd spend more than 250000 to find out. You might have some company. Uh, I myself personally have for the last two years and prior to uh, 
that, of course, was informed of a, a project called No Time to Lose through the NCSL, which was the Nevada uh, National Conference of State Legislators. And in that um, process, we looked at world um, class education, uh, school districts and countries across the world, not just here in the United States. Singapore, um, Estonia, um, we looked at Canada, we looked at, there were many, many countries and studies were done on those. And so what we're hoping to do is to create this commission to um, develop a statewide plan and develop some implementation plans so that we can start to develop that same um, world-class education system. Uh, Montana is a state, for example, that is doing something very similar. So um, with that being said, um, I won't rehear the bill, but if you have additional questions or specific questions, I'm happy to answer those. All right, with that, um, I would uh, suggest we do pass without the uh, overtime and just the um, designated um, fiscal pieces within Section 5 and Section 6. So moved by Senator Canizaro, second by Senator Neal. Any discussion on that? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion passes and I will take the floor statement on that. All right, we will go to Senate Bill 435. Kathy Crockett, Fiscal Analysis Division. Senate Bill 435 was heard in committee on May 17th. Um, existing law authorizes the Division of Healthcare Financing and Policy to impose an assessment on each operator of an agency to provide personal care services in the home and each operator of a medical facility that is required to obtain a license if after pulling the operators, at least 67% of those operators vote in favor of the assessment and limits the expenditure of the assessment revenue to provide supplemental payments or enhanced rates of reimbursement under Medicaid to operators upon whom the assessment is imposed and to administer provisions of the law governing such assessments. Um, Senate Bill 435 authorizes collective money to also be used to provide supplemental payments or enhanced rates of reimbursement to operators that are not subject to the assessment if such expenditure was identified as a potential use of the assessment in the polling of operators which received an affirmative vote of at least 67% of the operators on whom the assessment uh, would be imposed. The bill also authorizes the director to use not more than 15% of the money generated um, to provide additional supports and services to Medicaid participants with serious behavioral health conditions. The bill becomes effective upon passage and approval. The bill was presented by the Department of Health and Human Services Director as well as the Administrator of the Division of Healthcare Financing and Policy. There was um, an amendment presented by the Nevada Hospital Association which is available in Nellis and it would amend um, section 1.8 uh, subsection 4 um, and the intent of the amendment is to provide a long-term stability to the provider tax program by um, locking in the uses um, of the um, provisions in law and changes to state or federal law would require a new pool of operators uh, to continue the program. Regarding the uh, fiscal impact of this bill, it is a budget implementation bill and is required to implement the budget as approved uh, by the legislature. Um, there was no fiscal note submitted on the bill. However, um, the Medicaid budget does contain um, private hospital provider, provider tax revenue and associated um, supplemental payments. S testimony and support was provided by the Nevada Hospital Association, the Rural Hospitals Association, Valley Health System, Renown, Sunrise Hospital, and Dignity Health. There were no testimony in um, opposition or neutral. Um, 
if the committee wishes to take action on the bill and the appropriate motion would be to amend and do pass. Any discussion on this particular bill? Okay, seeing none, I'll accept a motion for amend and do pass. Senator Gansert, a second by Senator Neal. And any discussion on the motion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. Motion passes. Thank you very much. And um, I will give this particular uh, floor statement to uh, Senator Wynn. All right, we go on to 469. Kathy Crockett, Fiscal Analysis Division. Senate Bill 469 was heard in committee on May 15th. It makes a general fund appropriation to the Nevada Gaming Commission for employee registration and training fees for conferences. Um, the total amount is $17,680. It was presented by um, staff of the Gaming Control Board and this appropriation was recommended as part of the governor's recommended budget. There were no amendments discussed during the hearing and there was no testimony in support, opposition, or neutral. If the committee wishes to take action on the bill, the appropriate motion would be to do pass. Thank you very much. Any discussion on this bill? Um, uh, do pass, Senator Wynn, second from Senator Canizaro. Any discussion on this motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion passes, Senator Neal, you want to take this one? Thank you. And that brings us to our last work session item, Senate Bill 492. Thank you, Madam Chair. Wayne Thorley for the record, LCB Fiscal Analysis Division. Senate Bill 492 um, was heard in this committee on May 15th. It is a one-shot appropriation uh, for the purchase of uh, various pieces of equipment uh, with the uh, Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. It was presented by Director Settlemeyer. There was no testament of support, opposition, or neutral. Um, the um, committee uh, did have a work session on this bill I believe on Saturday um, and it was decided uh, to um, pull the bill from the work session uh, staff was instructed to work with um, staff from the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources to uh, look at the uh, various appropriation amounts in the bill again uh, we did that with the help of Director Settlemeyer and his staff uh, over the weekend and um, have reviewed uh, all the quotes and have uh, some updated uh, numbers to present uh, to the committee in various sections of the bill uh, for your consideration. <laughs> I think you lost ground. <laughs> but you're still standing, so we'll hear what we have to say. Um, I'll briefly uh, go through each section of the bill. Uh, if there are no uh, after staff review with uh, staff from DCNR, if there's no uh, recommended changes to the appropriation amount, I'll note that uh, in section one, there's no uh, recommended change to the appropriation amount. Section two, no recommended change. In section three, there is a recommended change from what is in the bill as introduced. The recommended appropriation amount in section three is $3,821,597. Section four, there's no recommended change to the appropriation amount. Section five, no change. Uh, six, seven, eight, and nine, no changes. Section 10, the replacement helicopter, there's a recommended change from 5 million as introduced to 
five million two hundred and ninety five thousand dollars five two nine five zero 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 in section 11 there's a recommended change from uh, the amount as introduced new amount one million five hundred and fifty six thousand three hundred and thirty seven dollars one five five six three three seven Section 12, no recommended change. Section uh, 13, there is a recommended change to 1,527,446. Section 14, there's a recommended change to 1,133,370. And there are no other recommended changes to the bill. I'll just reiterate that after review, the majority of the recommended changes result from uh, increases in uh, the uh, quote prices that the de department received for the various pieces of replacement equipment and happy to answer any questions that the committee members might have. Uh, Amend and do pass before it gets worse. <laughs> Senator, Senator Wynn, question? I was just going to ask if we roll in another day, will everything go up? I don't know. We're all so tired. I'm not sure. Yes, Senator Neal. I, I, I thought there were supposed to be some priorities. It just all went up. Literally. Did you already have a second on that? No. <laughs> I haven't even taken a first. Oh, I thought I thought. No, no, Pete no, said no. Something. We were on discussion because okay. we were um, a little confused. We thought when there thought was some work deal. done, there was going to be some priorities. We did not. We did not know. We, we were for the record. The same thing with yeah. more money. Fiscal staff. We did not uh, work with the department on prioritizing, but we can certainly do that. So I would um, suggest that we try again table this and try again and perhaps we um, prioritize some of this I think there were a lot of um, actually really good questions on May 15th when we heard this and while I recognize some of these things um, are going to go up um, there might also be some priorities of things that we can do differently um, this I believe if I, and now it's higher, I wrote down that this was a total amount of 15 million something something, and so now it's higher. I believe that, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, somebody on this group, I believe when we asked for some priorities, we were asking for uh, possibly some things that could be done a different way um, to uh, not escalate the costs. Any other discussion? Senator Gansert? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I don't know, since we've got the director here, if there's anything he can offer now or whether we need to wait on it. Director, you've waited this long. Come to the table, please, sir. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, you know, I was one who was probably pursuing this. I thought maybe going to fleet leasing, going, going to fleet, we could cut some of these costs rather than uh, than actually out and out purchasing him. Uh, but then I did have a conversation with uh, Director Settlemeyer, and uh, she said, for the most part, these vehicles are not available through fleet, uh, but maybe it's something we can look at going in, in, the, in the future, I believe, because clearly, you know, I just have a problem with $80,000 pickups uh, driving around. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead, Senator Wynn. I, I just have concerns when we're having a difficulty, difficult time voting out a million dollars to cover room and board for people that are working in the prison, and we don't have any kind of priority on this $15 million. I mean, I realize that you want and probably need all of this. Is there any kind of prioritizing of what some of these... I guess vehicles are needed and I mean I don't mean to make you please pick your go favorite ahead, child director. but <laughs> please go ahead director Settlemeyer. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, James Sumner, Director of the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. When the bill was last heard within here, I was directed to go back and look at fleet services and things of that nature. There are none of the vehicles that we were asking to be replaced, which again are being replaced. As we know, we had a lot of lean years. And so the department kept, or DCNR kept defraying the purchasing of these vehicles. So a lot of these now are 180, 190,000 miles when they're scheduled for replacement at 150,000 miles. And actually most of these are scheduled at 100,000 miles because of their nature. Uh, when you have to roll, whether it be a trailer for the food, for the fires, or whether it be porta potties or wood chippers or whatever, vehicles that tow other vehicles need to be safe and they have a lower mileage replacement request because of that. And I was told to go back and look through all our vehicles and none of them can be obtained by fleet services. However, we did discuss the concept coming forth next session for any of our other vehicles to try to go to fleet services. However, we will then have to ask for a budgetary ask as we do not have an account to get vehicles from fleet services. So we would have to create a sub account. What we traditionally do within Department of Conservation and Natural Resources is we have our internal fleet service kind of deal where conservation district has one vehicle, but if they have two people that need to go somewhere, we'll loan them one from state parks or we'll loan them one from state lands. And that's the call that was asked to come before me. In the past, all these were actually put into different divisions. So we'd actually have eight different bills in front of you. For some reason, LCB decided to take all of our bills and put them together. And in that respect is why you have one kind of an omnibus bill in front of you. I definitely wish it was differently because then at least maybe seven of them or six of them or two of them or one of them would have got through already uh, in that respect. But this comes from many years of lean service. We can go back and try to figure out what vehicles that are obviously exceeded their mileage requirements and try to come back. But I think that puts us in a slightly unsafe position, uh, especially with the helicopter. That helicopter is red tagged. We got it from the federal government. We're not allowed to have a federal employee in it. If we see someone in a fire that's a federal employee, we're instructed to leave them because they're safer in the fire than they are in this helicopter. That's kind of scary. But I will do whatever this body wishes me to do, Madam Chair. Right. No, no. I, I, I think. That was our choice. Yeah. No, no. I don't think the issue is that it's all in one bill. I think the issue. Well, Senator Wynn, do you have a comment? I don't have a problem with it all being in one bill. In fact, I wish that some of these other allocations had been in one bill, like for computer software and upgrades. But um, I, I just. I would have the same concerns everywhere else. I think I had the same concerns as expressed by Senator Neal. Um, I didn't realize that we've asked other people to prioritize um, what things are more important. Obviously, it sounds like the helicopter is important, but it also sounds like the wood chipper is of equal importance. So um, I'll just leave it at that. Senator Ganser. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, so we've heard a, a couple times now that the trucks are 190,000. They're way beyond their useful life, in part because of what you have to do with the trucks. The helicopter is red flagged, so we, you know, it, we need to remedy that. I, I don't know that we can really cut anything, and I, th I think you know what's happened this session is we have a lot of deferred requests that have accumulated over the years, and so that's why it looks like it's so much is because they haven't been able to get anything probably for, for quite a while, and I think the director stated that. So I, I would still be supportive of just moving this as is. Thank you. Or as with the amendment that was um, outlined by Mr. Thorley. Well, I guess I would ask what's the um, appetite on the committee? We can uh, roll this and ask a director to look at this and see if there's any way for us to prioritize anything differently. Um, or, yes, Senator Neal. I just have a funny feeling it's not going to come back any different. You might as well just move it. I just, I, don't, I swear, I feel I'm like, worried the at this point, I feel like it's more. comedic relief. 
I mean, but tonight <laughs> I changed from just 515. I changed prices tonight. So I'm like thinking, what's going on here? Madam Chair? Yes, Senator Neal. I mean, Senator Harris. If you're amenable, I would move to amend and do pass, get this thing out of here. And us out of here. Second. <laughs> I think it was the us part. I don't think it was the money at all. Okay. Senator Harris, uh, amend and do pass. Second from Senator Wynn. Um, any discussion on this particular item? All right. <laughs> Before he charges us more. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion passes. Let's just remember we're buying helicopters. Thank you, sir. No, I'm going to hand the floor statement to Senator Gokachia. I think it'll be good for him to read all those long floor statements with all those numbers. We can do it. She's here in the building. She's watching. We are going to add Senate Bill 162 to our work session before we close out. Thank you, Madam Chair. Wayne Thorley for the record, LCB Fiscal Analysis Division. Uh, Senate Bill 162 was heard earlier this evening, revises provisions related to... <laughs> to voting in county and city jails. Um, I won't go over bill summary since it was just recently heard by the committee. Um, it was presented by Senator Scheibel. She noted that with the first reprint, there are no longer any fiscal notes uh, on the bill. There was testimony in support from Battleborn Progress, no testimony in opposition or neutral. Um, there was a conceptual amendment that is at your desks that was presented um, by the Senator. Uh, related to the use of the uh, Secretary of State's ease system as a voting method for individuals in uh, county or city jail. And if uh, the committee wishes to move this bill, an appropriate motion would be to amend and do pass with the conceptual amendment. All righty. Any discussion on this bill? Senator Gokachia. I liked it better without the amendment, no e-voting. I would amend, make a motion to... To pass. So uh, we just spent $15 million, Senator Gokachia. Pull through for us. Come on. Honestly, we vote down education and voting. Madam but, Chair. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I would make a motion to amend and do pass. Thank you very much, Senator Harris. I'll have a second. second. Thank you, Senator Wynn. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say nay. nay. Nay from Senator Titus, Senator Gokachia, and Senator Ganser. Thank you very much. Motion passes. Floor statement to Senator Scheibel. Thank you very much. And with that, we'll close the hearing or the work session. And we'll go to the last thing on our agenda, which is public comment. And uh, is there anybody here in Carson City? Don't rush the table. Does anybody want? Public comment, no, seeing no one in Las Vegas. BPS, is there anyone on the phone lines? If you would like to provide public comment, please press star nine now, take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. <laughs> Okie dokie, we are gonna get out of here by 9.20. Six. All right. With that, uh, and I didn't even get called any names. All righty. With that, I will close uh, this evening of Senate Finance, and we'll see you all in the morning for another fun party of Senate Finance at 8 a.m. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>